Everyone knows the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but what changes does it undergo to promote cancer and other diseases? We sit down with Dr. Nathan Lanning of CSU Los Angeles and discuss his work regarding mitochondria dysfunction. This is Radio Bio. Hello and welcome to Radio Bio. I am your host, Stephen Wilson. And I am graduate student Morgan Quayle. We are joined here today by Dr. Nathan Lanning, a researcher at CSU Los Angeles. Thanks for coming up here today. Happy to be here, guys. Thanks, Stephen and Morgan. Can you tell us about your research topic? Sure. My, our research in our lab at Cal State Los Angeles, essentially what we do, we, we care a lot about mitochondria. So we, we try to find anything that's associated with mitochondria. Uh, we're, we're basically interested in the basic mechanisms of, of mitochondrial cell biology. Um, and we kind of view ourselves most of the time as disease agnostic. So we really don't care what disease we study as long as it's related to mitochondria. There's certainly a large focus in our lab on cancer biology as it relates to mitochondria and metabolism. Um, yeah, that's the main focus now. That's where most of our funding is. Um, and that's where we have most of the students distributed on our research topic. So uh, a lot of cancer biology. We do some uh, juvenile neurodegenerative diseases as well. Um, yeah, but really anything related to mitochondria. So you mentioned uh, mitochondria in disease. Would you mind telling us how does how does mitochondria dysfunction contribute to like cancer or I guess the other diseases that arise? Sure. So I'm a little bit biased, so I think it's really important for all diseases or or many diseases. If you think about it in mitochondrial biology in the context of cancer, cancer is a, is a disease where you have cells rapidly pro proliferating, rapidly dividing. You need to produce a whole lot of new pieces of cells. So essentially, um, the the new parts, the new uh, membrane, new proteins, anything that's needed to construct a new cell. And mitochondria are kind of the center of the construction of a lot of these materials. So we, we say that uh, biosynthetic precursors are created in mitochondria. If you think about the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, whatever you call it, um, that's responsible for producing a lot of molecules that are necessary to build biological molecules, so biosynthetic precursors. So in cancer biology, the mitochondria and specifically the TCA cycle are ramped up to produce a lot of these biosynthetic precursors so that new cells can be constructed and that cellular proliferation can occur. Uh, in cancer, there's also a lot of different oxidative damage going on and mitochondria are necessary for counteracting that damage. So there are a number of fronts in which mitochondria are important in cancer biology. In neurodegenerative disorders, uh, specifically the, the mitochondrial dysfunction uh, disorders that we look at, Elect subunits of the electron transport chain can be mutated and compromised in, in a number of these diseases. When the electron transport chain is compromised, uh, electron transport obviously does not pro uh, proceed efficiently. When the electron transport chain doesn't proceed efficiently, uh, reactive oxygen species are generated. There's a high generation of reactive oxygen species. These can damage cells and tissues. Also, you have low ATP production. Those together lead to these neurodegenerative disorders. So these reactive radical oxygen species, how, how are they damaging to the cell? How do they promote uh, carcinogenesis or the generation of these cancer cells? <clears throat> so there are a number of different ways, and we, we, let's just call them ROS, 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 reactive oxygen species. There, there are a number of ways which they um, can wreak havoc within cells or promote tumor biology. So uh, in in the normal way in which they damage cells is they you, you can kind of think of um, as a super ball that just kind of bounces around a cell tearing apart molecules all right so uh, they can they can associate with any essentially any sort of biological molecule destabilizing them when they're de those molecules are destabilized they're non-functional or they get targeted for degradation so in that way reactive oxygen species can be very damaging to cells Reactive ROS can also act as essentially a, a signaling um, input to cells as well. So many different signaling mechanisms are responsive to ROS levels. So in cancer cells, ROS levels can trigger uh, pro-proliferative or more importantly pro-migration and invasion signals. So we see, uh, not, not our lab specifically, but a number of other labs have shown that 
increased reactive oxygen species really induces the invasive potential of cancer cells, and that's, that's, that's one important way in which um, cancer cells do induce migration. So talking about how the mitochondria might be modified, um, and in reading some of the articles, we're talking about post-translational modifications and how it affects the mitochondria. Um, when you're talking about these mod these post-translational modifications, well, first I'd like you to explain a little bit about what that means. Sure. And also I'd like to know a little bit about is this something that's inherited to the next cell and the next cell, or is this not an epigenetic change? Okay. So there there are a number of ways in which you can talk about post-translational modification. So when we think about translation, uh, we have a protein produced. Uh, one of the, the most common researched uh, post-translational modifications are, are phosphorylation events. So phosphorylation events are essentially a phosphate group being stuck onto a protein or even a nucleotide. That's what we study a lot. We study kinases. There are a lot of kinases present in the mitochondria as well that can um, alter the phosphorylation status of proteins. There's also acetylation events, uh, simulation events, other, other types of post-translational modification events that can occur. And again, those often are going to either rewire the signaling inside mitochondria or cancer cells in general, the other aspects of the cancer cell, um, or they are going to alter the, the metabolic and biochemical pathways that are producing biosynthetic precursors or responding to reactive oxygen species, um, uh, other things. So, so those are typically, those post-translational modification events are, are absolutely impinged upon in cancer biology. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of, of great insight that you can, um, if you start looking at those, those events as a, as, a, as a systematic approach, you can see um, essentially what different signaling pathways are turned on and essentially what state the cell is in. I think you also asked whether those can be passed on down epigenetically. Um, I'll have to admit I don't know a whole lot about whether that's going to be passed down epigenetically. I do know that there are people investigating that, but that's a little bit outside of my, my proof. No, that's great. Thank you. In cancer biology courses, they typically cover the role of kinases in cancer. So in terms of mitochondrial metabolism or your studies involving the mitochondria, what role do you see kinases playing in that? So that's a really interesting question, and it definitely uh, tails off on Morgan's question, too. And it's an active area of research and debate within mitochondrial biology and cancer biology. So there are a number of groups that have published what you might consider famous kinases and phosphatases getting imported into mitochondria. Those studies have generally been hard to replicate, but when people have produced them, the, the data have been convincing. So I sit directly on the fence. There are, there are, so let's take, for example, EGFR. Um, so the epidermal growth factor receptor is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Some people have shown that that localizes to the mitochondria and alters phosphorylation status inside mitochondria. Same thing with uh, the SART kinase and some other uh, MAP kinases. Um, I haven't looked into that. What I have looked into is um, the really good data showing uh, mitochondrial-specific kinases and phosphatases, and there are 45 mitochondrial-specific protein kinases and phosphatases um, that sit inside either the inner membrane space or the matrix of the mitochondria. And we can, we've can we done some experiments where we knock each one of those down by siRNA um, and look at mitochondrial biology effects, so ATP production, TCA cycle, um, which way that's turning, what uh, metabolites it's producing, uh, mitochondrial membrane potential, and absolutely when you alter the expression of these 45 mito uh, mitochondrial protein kinases, some of them have a really large effect on mitochondrial biology. So certainly um, there are hypotheses out there that these mitochondrial kinases and phosphatases affect mito basic mitochondrial function. Um, and that they do promote um, cancer biology. There's a there's one that we've looked at a little bit when I was a postdoc associated with Jeff McKeegan and Natalie Nimai, um, PTP MT1, and this thing seems really important in, in actually maintaining the apoptotic response of mitochondria. So uh, whether it can dephosphorylate uh, proteins seems to have a big effect on whether apoptosis is induced. Um, and we, we know that apoptosis is, is definitely a mitochondrial regulated event. So absolutely with respect to metabolism and other mitochondrial biology like apoptosis, these kinases and phosphatases and phosphorylation are going to be regulating cancer biology. Can you elaborate on why that apoptosis um, would be important for a cell cycle, especially in the you know, if it's carcinogenic or if it's in sure. a cancer state. Sure. So the interesting thing about apoptosis is essentially all cells need to have a pro-life signal um, impinging upon them at all times to stop apoptosis from occurring. 
okay? So apoptosis always has to be suppressed. Um, we know that when cells start to have either genomic damage, high reactive oxygen species again, or other insults, other stress-related insults, they will actually start to induce apoptosis, all right? So, and your question re relates to the cell cycle. Absolutely, as, as cells progress through the cell cycle, there are all these different checkpoints um, where apoptosis essentially is ready to be enacted, but if, it, if the cell cycle passes the checkpoint quality control, it's still suppressed. Cancer cells have all of these insults. They have genomic rearrangements. They have genomic insults. They have high reactive oxygen species, so they have that type of stress. They have other um, nutrient-related stresses just because of the tumor microenvironment and yet they still suppress apoptosis. So if you think about these signaling events or these, these post-translational modification events going on in the mitochondria, which is probably exactly where you're going, it's really important that apoptosis remains suppressed in these cells even under these stressful, um, these stressful environments. So yeah, it, it, it certainly is important and it, it relates to the cell cycle, it relates to tumor biology in general, um, and that's definitely an active area of investigation. In your research, are you finding any mitochondria specific like oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes? That's that's a great question. So I was if you if you talk about your scientific heritage. So I was raised in a lab that that looked at these oncogenes and tumor suppressors. So absolutely that's that's some of my background and I I definitely agree that these oncogenes and tumor suppressors are absolutely critical for for uh, promoting cancer cell biology. Metabolism is important too, and there's a, there's a great link between metabolism and these, these oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Uh, your question is, is have we identified any? I don't know. I think so, there, there have been a couple of um, what we call bona fide uh, tumor suppressors identified um, out there uh, within the TCA cycle. So fumarate hydro, uh, hydro FH and then what was the other one? SDH. Those were both identified as bona fide uh, tumor suppressors. When they are mutated, uh, that promotes cancer. It essentially causes a backup of some of the TCA cycle metabolites. Those TCA cycle metabolites go on to modify other proteins, um, and those 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 actual metabolite modification of other proteins can trigger an oncogenic program. So our lab specifically has not identified what we might call a tumor suppressor or an oncogene yet. Uh, we're studying this protein uh, AK4 which is a putative nucleotide kinase, um, and we think that it definitely participates in cancer programs, but whether we, we can show that it's actually an oncogene or a tumor suppressor yet, we, we, we really haven't progressed that far. But um, I do like the idea that there are mitochondrial-specific oncogenes and tumor suppressors, and that's, that's definitely an active area of investigation. That's awesome. I actually um, was curious. We've gotten a little bit away from the mitochondria aspect, and we talked about how it's post-translationally modified and other modifications that happen to metabolism. Um, one of your one of the reviews I was reading was talking about how alternative glucose metabolism um, is important to the role of what you're studying. And I'd like to know a little bit about um, the alternative glucose metabolism and how that applies to your um, model, as well as um, I'd like you to explain a little bit of the Warbur effect. Okay, love that question. So. I'll give you a little bit of uh, unsolicited uh, history here. When I was an undergrad and a graduate student, I could not stand biochemistry. I metabolism was just a waste of time to study. That makes two of us. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay we, good, that's good. easily relatable. <laughs> okay. It's hard. It's flashcards. Yeah. Flashcards yeah. all day long. Yeah, there you go. Flashcards. Write it out. Um, memorize it. When I became a postdoc, that was still my mindset when I started in the lab uh, of Jeff McKeegan of, of uh, mitochondrial systems biology. And just st I just picked up you know the literature, started diving into it, and it just, for whatever reason, it just clicked. And I thought metabolism is so cool. Biochemistry is so cool. I was a signal transduction guy before that, um, but you can really relate a lot of the signal transduction programs to metabolism. They're, they're very same. All the different routes that signal transduction pathways can take, metabolism can do the same thing. Um, also, the metabolic flexibility, and that's where we're going with your question, question um, within mitochondria and in cells as a whole is just is fascinating. All the different bio chemical and metabolic routes that these these carbon substrates can take is just fascinating and cancer cells are really really good at rewiring metabolism so there's alternative glucose metabolism that can occur um, if glucose is restricted cells cancer cells just start sucking up glutamine like crazy so glutamine can essentially enter what we think of as the bottom of the tca cycle and it can um, uh, do what we call anaplaresis which it can essentially replenish um, the different metabolites that are not there due to restriction of glucose or due to them being utilized for other things. 
All right, so glucose comes in really quick in cancer cells. Cancer cells suck up glucose. They do that again to create all these biosynthetic precursors. They're creating all these molecules that are needed, these, these, these uh, little, little tiny molecules that are needed to create the, the larger uh, macromolecules for building a cell. All right, so they're sucking up lots of glucose. However, they have to start sucking up uh, glutamine too because a lot of those metabolites get taken out of the TCA cycle to build these uh, these large macromolecules. So the TCA cycle, in order to keep on turning, needs to find an alternative nutrient source, so it takes in glutamine. Um, they produce a lot of lactate. That lactate can go out, can cause reactive oxygen species, can acidify the, the external environment of the cell. That, that promotes the cancer program as well. Um, you look at malate metabolism. You, you can essentially identify any, any TCA cycle metabolite and, and, and see what is it is important for, whether it's important for uh, nucleotide metabolism, whether it's important for fatty acid and, and lipid, uh, phospholipid metabolism, um, all these things are, are, are amino acid metabolism. All these things are really important, and there's been a spate of papers that have come out over the past decade showing that the cancer cell needs to identify what is important for its specific cancer type and essentially rewire glucose metabolism or glutamine metabolism to uh, supply that specific metabolite, and, and yeah, it's fascinating. So, so yeah, just yeah. to make some of mm -hmm. those connections between glycolysis and, and mitochondrial metabolism. So, so glucose is oxidized down to pyruvate within the cytosol, just like you said. Um, and something we, we often don't teach in, in uh, undergraduate and even graduate cell biology is that a lot of that actually occurs right near or on the outer membrane of the mitochondria. A lot of glycolysis actually does. Um, so you, you've got this pyruvate then that jumps into, the, is imported into the uh, mitochondrial makes it matrix and uh, is converted to acetyl-CoA, which then um, condenses um, into, into the TCA cycle with oxaloacetate to form citrate. And then citrate is, is one of the first metabolites in the way that we usually consider the TCA cycle turning. Um, and, but citrate also jumps out of the TCA cycle. It's the, it's the key metabolite for... Uh, fatty acid and phospholipid production. If you think of a new cell that needs to be, if a new cell needs to be built, think of all of the membrane structures, the plasma membrane, the mitochondrial membrane, the ER, the nucleus, etc. All these membranes require uh, fatty acids and phospholipids. So citrate is really, really important for building those. Um, so that's that's a direct connection between glucose and uh, glycolysis and, and uh, mitochondrial metabolism. Um, you can do all kinds of awesome labeling experiments. Um, you can label uh, carbons, you can label uh, hydrogens and look at where these metabolites are coming out. Uh, Dr. Philippe, Fabian Philippe here does a lot of, lot of that and he does some really good assays with that and you can really see what type of metabolism, what type of glucose metabolism, standard or alternative glucose metabolism is required um, for these different cancer cells. Uh, you touched upon some misconceptions about, I guess, uh, glycolysis and importing into the mitochondria or at least its location in terms of the cell. Are, is there any other misconceptions that people aren't really aware of? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know if it's a misconception or just a it's not it's not uh, famous enough yet mm -hmm. to bring into textbooks. Um, there's a lot of really good, what I was referring to, there's a lot of really good papers that show there are these large complexes of many of the glycolytic enzymes that essentially associate into a large complex. And a lot of those times, a lot of times those large complexes um, can be fractionated into the outer mitochondrial membrane, not the inside of the outer mitochondrial membrane, but the outside. So they're right near or right on the mitochondria. And that makes sense, right? If you're trying to feed um, the mitochondria with some of these metabolites that are result from glycolysis, they can hop right into uh, mitochondria. Other misconceptions. Um, I don't know that there are other misconceptions. There's, when, when you're talking about biochemistry and metabolism, there's just a lot, a lot that's, that's, either glossed over or, or there's just not enough time in the undergraduate world to, to study that, right? The TCA cycle is turning both ways. It can essentially turn both ways depending on which metabolites it needs. Um, there are all these branch points coming off. Again, maybe another misconception is glutamine. Uh, many cells use glutamine almost at the same rate that they use glucose. So glutamine is being uh, imported into cells in order to, to supply TCA cycle metabolites so the TCA cycle can keep um, turning. It's also being imported so that it can be exported again and, and, and that way import essential amino acids and also keep mTOR signaling and other pro-life uh, signals on. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful uh, metabolic uh, pathways that we, we often don't think of. You already mentioned Warburg. Um, that's one. 
Uh, Warburg is a, it was, is, a, is a great metabolic pathway where you're, you're essentially um, rushing down glycolysis, producing lots and lots of metabolites, even in the presence of, of enough oxygen, um, producing lots of lactate, and, and cancer cells do that for a number of reasons, yeah. Uh, boiling it down for some of our listeners that may not have read some of these reviews, and how does metabolism affect the life cycle? So we said how it affects cancer cells, but like how does that affect a cell in switching into a cancerous state, or how does it affect a cell in just general? So directly metabolism? Yeah. So, well, one of the ways to think about that, and let's we can bring it you know, down to the level of the cell cycle. When cells are progressing through the cell cycle, um, through some of the, the, the gap phases and even synthesis, you're producing a lot of molecules. So the cell needs to meet those, those biosynthetic and energetic demands. They need more energy. They need more energy in the form of ATP to carry out all of these biosynthetic um, reactions, which are certainly anabolic in, in nature. So you're, 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 you're using energy and you're also creating new molecules. So if you don't have the metabolic requirements to, to, to meet those production standards, uh, there are, there are checkpoints that are essentially going to slow down, um, slow down, uh, the cell cycle, slow down the production of these biological molecules. If you think about, uh, there are some, what we call master regulators. So AMP kinase, uh, is considered a master regulator. It's a signaling molecule and it really, uh, regulates whether cells are in an anabolic or a catabolic state. And AMP kinase is directly re re uh, regulated by AMP levels and then indirectly regulated by ATP levels. So whether or not there's enough energy present is going to regulate whether um, the cell can progress this cycle and uh, continue in uh, anabolic mode. Okay, there's also another regulator that, that happens, also happens to be downstream of AMP kinase, but also uh, functions in parallel. That's the mTOR signaling pathway. The mTOR signaling pathway is directly responsive to nutrients. So whether or not there's enough essential amino acids are going to regulate whether, whether mTOR is on or off. And that's definitely a, a major regulator of pro cell proliferation status as well. So whether or not there's enough metabolites, amino acids, um, carbon-based substrates that produce enough ATP, whether there's enough, enough of those inside the cell is going to regulate whether, whether these master regulators of, of what we call metabolism are on or off, and their on or off status absolutely regulates the progression through the cell cycle and whether a, a cell can essentially transform. So yeah, it's, it's definitely all related. That's awesome. Uh, you're going to have to forgive us. I know your research focuses on other disease models uh, involving the mitochondria, uh, and we've been primarily talking about cancer. So uh, what are the other disease models that you're looking at? Oh, that's a good question. We, we, we certainly do focus on cancer, so I'm, I'm certainly more comfortable in the cancer arena, but I'm happy to talk about the other models. The other model that we focus on uh, most specifically is called Lee syndrome. L-E-I-G-H syndrome. It's a syndrome that's usually identified in children around the age of one or two. Um, it's, they present with neuromuscular disorders. Um, and essentially, they're not producing enough energy. They have these mutations in their electron transport chain um, complex subunits. These mutations are thought to cause the electron transport chain is essentially not to function um, well or efficiently. And this inefficient uh, function of the electron transport chain causes a reduction in ATP production, and it also cr increases reactive oxygen species within the cell. These two together combine to really, um, it, it affects all the cells in these, in these very young patients, but it really affects those cells that require a lot of, of energy and that are really sensitive to ROS. So those just happen to be um, neurons and muscles and some other cells as well. So they, they present with these disorders first. There's no cure. These patients typically die within six to seven years of diagnosis. Diagnosis. It's very sad. It's it's a relatively rare rare disease, but it's one that we we are really intent on make, hopefully making some headway in basic research. Because all these patients are young, there's not a whole lot of patient-derived cells out there or cell models to study. So one of the things we want to do in our lab is use some new CRISPR technology to introduce the exact mutations that are identified in human patients into uh, normal fibroblasts, normal neurons, normal kidney cells, other types of cells that are affected within this disease. Um, so that's what we're studying these in these these other mitochondrial-related uh, disorders. And then we again we've identified this this protein AK4 that's a mitochondrial matrix protein. When we knock this thing out, uh, energy levels in the cells increase uh, quite dramatically, and there's a really a good ability of cells to manage reactive oxygen species. 
So in the context of producing these mutations, we also want to, on top of that, either chemically inhibit or genetically uh, delete AK4 and determine whether that's maybe perhaps a potential therapeutic outlet for these patients. Um, so yeah, that's that's a hardcore mitochondrial disease, and that's that's the context that we in which we just uh, study these diseases. That's awesome. I actually um. For, for some of us that are a little ignorant about um, reactive oxygen species, I have always been told um, to eat lots of blueberries. Okay, and, yeah, and, you get your antioxidants. Yeah, exactly, the antioxidants. <laughs> yeah. Um, how can diet affect, because, right, we're talking about the metabolism of the cell, but how can diet of like a whole organism like ourselves affect us on a cell us on a cell basis. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the thing I'm gonna talk, and at the end of, your, of me talking, you're gonna say, well, you really didn't answer my question, <laughs> and there's a reason for that. So I've gone to a couple of these these conferences, uh, metabolism, diet, and disease, put on by BMC, and they're awesome, they're wonderful, and you get these experts from all over the world talking about diets and how diet can affect cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, this, that, and the other thing, and they got great research. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, oftentimes these the, the the data presented completely contradict each other. And, and, and just from my reading of the literature, I'm certainly not an expert, so please don't take what I'm saying as, as expert advice. It's really difficult to determine um, how specific diets are going to specifically affect dif different diseases. Certainly diet overall has an effect on our all overall health. There's no doubt about that. With respect to antioxidants and uh, and disease and reactive oxygen species. Um, a couple of, of meta, meta studies have come out recently that have really shown that eating a lot of antioxidants might not actually counteract the reactive oxygen species within our cells. Whether or not those antioxidants are actually soluble, whether they actually get delivered to our cells, whether they get delivered to the places um, that counteract reactive oxygen species is now an outstanding question. So if you like your blueberries, keep on eating them, but um, you may or may not be uh, affecting your your redox status. So there's cells. no miracle <laughs> drug? I mean, come on. <laughs> That'd be nice, but uh, unfortunately super not. Foods? <laughs> super Superfoods? Superfoods. I, like I like the title. <laughs> <laughs> they just taste good. Yeah, look good enough. You... We're talking about different techniques you use to study these mitochondria. And I, I personally use CRISPR all the time, so I'm interested nice. on how um, you're using it, especially because you said you're adding in and removing at specific locations. So what model do you use to do this? It's hard in a, a large uh, multicellular eukaryote, right, to add in. So what kind of model are you using and how, like what exactly are you using CRISPR for? Yeah, we absolutely cheat. We don't use large multicellular organisms. We, we, we study the cells. So yeah, there, there are absolutely other labs out there who are doing CRISPR on whole model organism basis and, and absolutely they're, they're doing wonderful things and their, their uh, results are going to be, um, I think, probably more interpretable than ours. So we're study we're still in, in cells in a dish. That's where we do all of our uh, work. We are just starting the CRISPR uh, project. So we have identified about five mutations in Lee syndrome that have popped up again and again in patients. So what we're doing is we're using the HDR to introduce these exact same mutations into uh, what we call naive or primary cells. So fibroblasts, just skin cells. Uh, we also have some kidney cells, and we have some primary neurons. So we're introducing those mutations into these cells. And then we're going to study uh, mitochondrial biology and whether or not, on top of that, we can either delete AK4, okay, so we can delete AK4. AK4 also has a kinase, do a kinase domain for its activity, and there is a uh, mutation within that kinase uh, domain that that renders it inactive. So we can use CRISPR to introduce that mutation as well. And reactivate it. Exactly, so and, and determine whether we can, whether its activity can actually be modulated. If it can, that would be wonderful. Um, and if, if, it, if modulating its activity affects uh, Lay syndrome patients and re restores their ATP levels and, and drops their reactive oxygen species levels, that would be wonderful because again, it's an enzyme, it can be targeted by a molecule. Um, so getting back to your question, uh, we have just started the CRISPR uh, projects, and I agree, it's hard. We're doing it in cells, just in cells, not in animals. So people will probably say, well, it's easier for you. Yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, we're just starting it, and we're just learning the techniques, um, and we, we actually don't have any results from that yet. But we're we're really, really happy to have uh, re recently received uh, some funding from C Superb, which is a California State University-wide uh, funding agency uh, for this project. Well, I'd like to ask you some lighthearted questions. Sure. Um, as much as I'd love to keep asking you about <laughs> the epigenetics of cancer, um, how is CSULA um, different from UC Merced? I know we're not in the you know in the middle of a big city, but like, sure. how do you 
like you're collaborating with us, obviously. Yeah. So what do you feel it's different? Yeah, we, it, there, there are a lot of differences and there are differences that complement each other. We're really lucky to uh, have this collaboration set up with the Philip Lab. Um, they're, they, they're filling in things that we can't do. So what are the differences? So UC Merced is a UC school. So it's, it's traditionally going to be probably a bigger campus with more resources applied towards basic research and, and translational research, research in general. It's considered a, an, an R1 institution, uh, which means the faculty here have a, have a really high focus on research. That's, that's one of their main uh, commitments here. And you can see that with the infrastructure here. If you take a walk through your labs here, which the Philip Lab was um, uh, kind enough to allow me to do yesterday, um, it, it's, it's a wonderful space lots of of equipment so the equipment in the infrastructure is, is what are really the differences um, you have the gcms uh, uh, equipment you have all kinds of wonderful microscopes pl plate readers um, uh, lots of space for doing cell culture or housing animals etc and that costs a lot of money so mm -hmm. if you're going to be an institution that really focuses on uh, research you're going to have to pour a lot of research or excuse me resources meaning dollars into that. Um, our institution is considered a PUI, primarily undergraduate institution. So over here you have PhD programs, you have postdocs walking around. We have no PhD um, in our in our basic research at our university. We don't have postdocs. A couple of people have postdocs, but they're extremely rare. Um, most of the research is driven by undergraduates and master's students. So master's is the highest level that we, we award. So we really focus on getting undergraduates into the lab, getting master's students into the lab and really preparing them to go on then to a, a UC Merced type PhD program. So we're trying to train the students to be um, eligible to get into a PhD program. Um, so we don't have the same amount of resources. We have good resources. Uh, Cal State Los Angeles has, has wonderful resources for a Cal State uh, school. I'm, that's one of the reasons I, I, I was happy to go there. I, was, I feel lucky to be there because they do have uh, better resources than some of the other uh, comparable institutions. Um, but yeah, you're, you're really going to see a difference in the focus on research and the resources available for research. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the compliments, by the yeah. way. Oh, no, I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and... um, besides the Philip Lab, do you envision more collaborative work with other labs on the UC Merced campus? Yeah, so the collaboration with the Philip Lab has been wonderful. Um, and because of that, I'm absolutely keeping my eyes open and, and, and glad to see the people here. And, and that's one of the thing where the Philip Lab has been great for us. They've, again, supplied us with something we can't do. We're, we love to study metabolism, but we do not have the GCMS outlet. We don't have the systems bio, the bioinformatics outlet that you guys have. Um, so you're really filling a big hole there. And, and absolutely, if there are other labs here that can fill those holes, we're, we're always interested in working with them. Hopefully there's something that we can give in return, right? Some mutually beneficial, um, maybe mechanistic insights that we can give from our lab or siRNA screens, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the type of collaborations that we're working, looking for. Thank you for coming on today. Yeah, thanks again. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate nice, it. Really nice to meet you. Good. Um, this is Radio Bio signing off. Radio Bio is supported by the Quantitative and Systems Biology Graduate Group at the University of California, Merced.